What's up? It turns out that you don't need a deep fryer to make delicious crispy potatoes in the home. Today, I'm gonna show you my two favorite ways to do just that, including a super craveable restaurant version for my past that anyone can make at home. The first style of crispers that I'm gonna show you guys how to make is basically a tribute to this classic Kenji Lopez alt recipe from Syria Seats. To get started, I'll need a large pot, in this case, my six and a half quart Dutch oven, and into that, I'll add four quarts of tap water, and behind that, I'll add in 20 grams of salt and five grams of baking soda. The baking soda here is at the core of what makes this recipe special because baking soda makes water more basic, or it raises its pH, and that somehow makes potatoes easier to crisp. How exactly? Well, more on that in just a second. For now, I'm gonna drop this pot onto my stove to bring it up to a hard boil. I'm also gonna preheat my oven to 450F at 230C, and then I'll grab some potatoes. In this case, I'm using Yukon Gold potatoes because they have a nice inherent sweetness to them that pairs really well with the sauce that I'm gonna show you guys later on. But also russets would work. I would say just avoid red potatoes though because they're a little bit too waxy for this process. In total, I'm peeling four pounds of Yukon Golds here, and that might seem like a lot, but these potatoes are gonna lose a decent amount of their water in the roasting slash crisping process and they're gonna shrink. Once I've got them all peeled up, I'm gonna cut them into large rustic chunks like this. Again, they're gonna shrink, so make them a little bit larger than bite sized. And there we go. Once I got these all cut up, I'm gonna head back over to my water. And at this point, it's at a ripping boil. So I'll add in my potatoes and simmer them hard for about eight to 10 minutes. Eight to 10 minutes later, when I check back, you can see that the outside of this potato is looking a little mushy, I guess is the right word. That's actually a good thing in this context. That higher pH water breaks down the pectin in the outside of the potato, making it softer much faster, basically. In a hot oven, that mushy potato is gonna dehydrate and leave behind a lacy, brittle exterior with lots of little air pockets as if it was almost deep fried. Now, I'm gonna grab a little squeezer of olive oil and add in a lot of it, basically, like four to six tablespoons. And once the oil's in, I'll give these potatoes four to six hard tosses in the bowl. And now these look kind of like potato wedges that you would get at the grocery store with rotisserie chicken. Those also get covered in a thick slurry of gelatinized potato starch to achieve extra crispiness. Now to make these potatoes crispy, I'm gonna grab a sheet tray from my oven that I preheated. Again, it's at 450F and then I'll dump out my potatoes. I'll spread those out evenly so they don't steam each other up and then I'll move the sheet tray over to the oven and roast these potatoes for about 30 to 45 minutes. I'll check back halfway. In the meantime, I'm gonna show you guys how to make one of my all-time favorite sauces for not just crispy potatoes, but like all foods. I'm talking about romesco sauce. To make that into my food processor, I'll add 200 grams of roasted red bell peppers. These are just the kind that come in the jar and I highly recommend always having them on hand because they're super versatile and I think underrated. Behind that, I'll add in 30 grams of pepperoncinis, 50 grams of salted almonds, 10 grams of shallot or red onion, one garlic clove, 20 grams of champagne or white wine vinegar, a little squeezer of honey, let's call it five grams, 75 grams of olive oil, and then 30 grams of fried and dried bread. For this, I took a few slices of the baguette that I made last week for my banh mi video, and then I fried it hard in a liberal amount of olive oil on the stovetop. But if you don't have any rustic, unsweetened bread like this baguette, I'd say you can fry off some panko breadcrumbs, but you'll probably need 10 to 15 grams less. Once these are nice and colorful on the first side, I'm gonna move this pan to the oven to roast it and dry it out at 450F for about 10 to 15 minutes. And there we go, and it goes. Now the lid goes on and I'll spin this until everything is pretty well broken down. I don't want a full paste here though because the bread and almonds bring some nice, fun rustico texture. If you haven't had romesco before, it's nutty, sweet, a little bit spicy, and full of complexity. It's really good with grilled meats like chicken or fish, and I really love it with roasted vegetables like squash or sweet potatoes. Of course, it's also gonna be really great with crispers like we're making today. One factor to consider with a sauce that has bread in it though is that it's gonna absorb all of the fat, making it a little bit thicker over time. To solve for that, I usually add a little squeezer of olive oil right into the mix before I use this sauce, just to keep it a little bit looser. A small touch of cold water could also work if you don't wanna add the calories. Now, after 20 minutes, I'm gonna check back on my potatoes and give them a flip. As you can see, most of the color and crispiness is coming from contact with the hot sheet pan. So it's important to shake things up and make sure new parts are touching that pan. Overall, these need more time, at least 20 to 25 more minutes. So back into the oven they go so I can thank the sponsor of this video, Vessi Shoes. 
If you're not familiar, Vessi makes 100% waterproof, 100% vegan sneakers that are breathable, lightweight, and honestly, very comfortable. I don't fully understand the 100% waterproof thing, but yes, you can fully submerge your foot in a tub of water on your kitchen counter and your sock will stay bone dry. That's thanks to their material called Dymatex that's woven into the knit. More practically, I know these things are waterproof because I spill food on them while filming videos all the time. And to clean them, I just wash them in the sink with soapy water like a dirty dish. Or if they're really filthy, I'll just drop them in the washing machine because they're machine washable. But I'm really here for the breathability and antibacterial insoles. If you've ever spent 12 hours inside of a sweaty, swampy kitchen clog, then you know the raw brutality of the inside of that shoe. So to give Vesti a try, click the link in my description and use code Brian at checkout for $25 off each pair of adult Vesti shoes. 25 bucks off, the link is in my description, use code Brian. Thank you, Vesti. After 45 minutes of roasting at 450F, these potatoes are ready to come out. As you can see, they're super well roasted and deeply golden brown. And check this out, the outside is covered with a craggy, crispy potato starch that makes it look almost deep fried. To serve these, I'm gonna make a little stack on a BB plate to make them look nice and pretty. By the way, four pounds of potatoes should yield four very large portions, or six if you're sensible. Next, I'm gonna slather these with that romesco sauce that we just made, and I'll mention that I did drizzle in about a tablespoon of olive oil to loosen this back up to a saucy consistency. Finally, I'll hit this with some flaky salt to bring some shimmer and pop, and there we go. Without a deep fryer in sight, these potatoes are deeply crisped up, and the romesco sauce on top is roasty, it's nutty, and just a touch sweet. In Spain, potatoes and romesco are actually a very classic combination, and if you haven't had it, I think you should try it for yourself. Up next, I'm gonna show you guys how to make a crushed and pan-fried waxy potato with a super bright herby sauce called Crusher Tins. I used to make these every night as a line cook. To make these into my Dutch oven, I'll add two bags, or about three to four pounds of waxy fingerling potatoes. If you can't find fingerlings, I would say sub in any other variety of a small waxy potato. Don't use Yukons or Russets for this because they'll fall apart. Next, I'll top up the fingerlings with four quarts of water, two very strong pinches of salt, and then a sprig of rosemary and a few sprigs of thyme. I'll also grab a head of garlic and cut that in half and throw it in the water. Now, I'll drop this on the stove over medium high heat, and once the water's up to a full simmer, I'll turn the heat down to medium low and cook these fingerlings at a bare simmer for 30 to 35 minutes or until they're just getting tender. While those cook, I'm gonna make a vibrant herby salsa verde to top them with. For that, I'll grab a quarter of a red onion and give it a very small dice. Shallots would also work here, and once I've got that dice small, I'm gonna add in a half cup or so of red wine vinegar to marinate these onions for 15 to 20 minutes. The onions will absorb some of that vinegar and allow us to sneak in some much needed acidity into this salsa verde while also keeping it separated from the herbs. If we added straight lemon or vinegar to the sauce, it would cook the herbs and turn everything brown. While those bathe in acidity, I'm gonna cut the herbs. First, I'll grab 15 grams or one small BB clamshell of fresh basil, and I'll give it what's called a chiffonade. That's chef for cutting thinly across the leaves like this to avoid bruising it. Once I get to the stem end, I'll turn it 90 degrees and repeat the same move. I'm almost dicing the basil because if you over chop it, it's not gonna taste very good and get kind of brown. Once I've got that broken down, I'm gonna scoot it off to the side and then I'll combine 25 grams of parsley, no stems, then 25 grams of cilantro, stems are okay, and then 20 grams of capers. I'll give all that a hefty chopping to break it down pretty far, but wait a minute. I'm also gonna add a strong pinch or about five grams of coarse kosher salt. This added grit helps macerate the herbs and draw out some of their flavor, but it also somehow sets the color. I don't know exactly what the mechanism is there. I think maybe sodium helps preserve chlorophyll. It sounds right. Now, once I've got the parsley, cilantro, and capers all finely minced, I'm gonna fold in the basil and then chop it just a few more times to get everything mixed together. I'll move that into a little container and then I'll grab a whole lemon in my microplane and rip off the zest. The zest is gonna bring the aromatic memory of lemon, but without the acidity. Behind the zest, I'll add in 115 grams of nice tasting extra virgin olive oil, and then I'll add in all of my marinated red onions. Whatever vinegar comes with the onions is gonna be totally fine to mix in. In fact, I'll sneak in a tiny bit of additional vinegar and then I'll stir everything to combine. Just like with the romesco, salsa verde is a sauce for all occasions. It's perfect for grilled meats like steak or fish, and it's amazing on grilled octopus if you're cool with eating smart aliens. Back at the stove, it's been about 35 minutes of simmering here, so I'm gonna stir up these potatoes and check them for doneness. They should be soft, but not mushy. 
at all. We want to preserve that firm fingerling waxiness because that's going to hold these together much better for what's to come. Now, ideally, you should cook these potatoes ahead of time and cool them down naturally. They tend to hold their shape during the refry much better once the starch in the potatoes has cooled and converted to resistant starch. I put mine in the fridge and I can't really say that's a great idea because it's definitely kind of hard on the old girl, but I'm not trying to wait three hours for cold potatoes. So about 20 minutes later, these potatoes are cool enough to crush. Before I do that, I'll preheat a large cast iron pan over high heat and make sure my oven is at 450F, 230C. Now we call these potatoes crusher tins because they get crushed. That waxiness of the fingerling holds them together just enough so that you can essentially have a potato pancake. I crushed this very gently until it was about a half inch thick like this. And check out how much flat starchy surface area this has now. That flatness is gonna allow mucho pan connection and this thing's gonna get crisp as hell. Once I've got a whole plate full of crusher tins, I'm gonna move over to the stove and add in a liberal amount of neutral oil. I'm using light olive because it has a higher smoke point than extra virgin and it's less toxic than canola or soybean. Now, once that's hot, I'm gonna lay in my flattened potatoes one at a time carefully until this pan is totally full. Don't worry about overcrowding here because these potatoes are quite dry and won't create any crispiness ruining steam in the process. Once these are all snugged up, I'm gonna let them fry untouched on this first side for at least three to five minutes. When I check back five minutes later, you can see that I've got a nice, thick, deeply golden brown crust forming on that first side. So now I'm gonna flip these potatoes over. I wanna get maximum surface contact on side two. So I'm gonna try and get these sitting on their flat sides. From here, I'll keep cooking these for another three to five minutes. Now, when I come back, I'm gonna give this entire pan a shimmy and a shake to get some new potato areas touching that hot pan. To finish this, I'm gonna move this pan into a very hot 450 oven to roast for 20 to 30 minutes. Halfway, I'm gonna come back and shake the potatoes in the pan to make sure all the surfaces have had a chance to touch the hot pan, and I'll give them another 10 minutes from here. After 25 minutes of a high roasting, these fingerlings are ready to come out. As you can see, we've got a wide variety of different textures going on here. You get super crunchy, you get waxy creamy, and you get some of that deeply roasted flavorful skin that isn't papery or tough at all. To finish, I'm gonna hit the whole lot with a generous pinch of salt, just like I would some freshly fried French fries. Then I'll pile them on a little baby plate, just like I did before. Once they're nice and neatly stacked, I'm gonna drown them in that fresh, herbal, salty salsa verde. You guys, it's crunchy, crusty potatoes bathed in brilliant green. Whether you choose to go with Kenji style potatoes or the restaurant grade crusher tins, I hope you guys feel like you've got two new moves in your toolkit for making potatoes crispy without a fryer. And don't sleep on these sauces, you guys. Use them on everything, they're super easy to make. I really hope you try this soon. Let's eat this thing.